So I suppose that now that we're about two thirds of the way through the course, we should probably come up with some operational definition of what analysis actually is in mathematics. What is it that makes analysis feel and taste like analysis, other than the utter fear and dread that it strikes into the heart of undergraduates? Well, there's a real sense in which analysis is about measuring and controlling the distances between things. Where those things can be something as simple as points, but they can be something as complex as, I don't know, functions or sequences or these, any of these other sorts of objects that we study. That if our primary interest is in discussing questions about, say, convergence by saying that the distance between the elements of a sequence and its limit gets arbitrarily small, then it feels like we're doing analysis. So our next goal is to take much of what we've learned up until this point in the semester and just take it one step higher in abstraction, in the sense that we've been doing a lot of measuring and controlling distances without really calling it such this semester. And what we want to do now is to learn to see that water that we've been swimming in a little bit more clearly. And so what we, we're going to do is take the idea of distance that has been baked into so many of our definitions up until this point in the course and generalize it out to a more general notion of what it means to measure distances called a metric. And we'll study the properties of spaces that have a metric on top of them called metric spaces. We'll see some examples and then by the time we're done with this next set of few videos, we should see a really powerful example of how we can use analysis that we already know how to do to study a different kind of convergence of objects that are not just plain old real numbers, but are in fact functions. So that's ultimately where we're going, because at the end of the day, our main goal for this semester is to come up with a good way of studying how we can approximate one function by other functions. And one of the most important tools in being able to approximate is being able to tell how close are we. And the idea of metrics in its generality is going to help us to understand what that looks like. So what is a metric space? What ought it to look like if we measure distance in a more general way than we're used to? And how do we know that we've already been doing this in a sense as we've been working in real analysis up until this point? So one of the things that should tip us off to the presence of distance measurement and distance control in analysis so far is the fact that we see a whole lot of those absolute value bars in a lot of the definitions and a lot of the theorems that we care about so far. As just one example, think about the definition of what it means for a function to be continuous that we've been talking about at length in this chapter. A function is said to be continuous at a point x0 if for every epsilon that's positive there is a delta that's positive such that whenever the distance between x and x0 is less than delta, then the distance between f of x and f of x0 is less than epsilon. And I just use the word distance almost unconsciously because this is the way that I think when I'm doing analysis. But if we just look at this without going a layer deeper, what we see are absolute values of differences of real numbers. And what is it actually that the absolute value is measuring? Well, the absolute value, as we first learn in algebra sometime, the absolute value of a number just measures its distance away from zero on the number line. So if my number is positive, then the absolute value is just equal to itself. If my number is negative, the absolute value is equal to the opposite of itself. It's just measuring a distance from zero. Similarly, if I have two real numbers, x and y, and I subtract them and then I take the absolute value of their difference, what I'm measuring is the distance between x and y. And so these absolute values litter our definitions because we are trying to measure a distance between points. And in the case of making it less than some positive quantity, we're also trying to control how large that distance can get. So that's what all those absolute values and less than epsilons and less than deltas in, in our analysis definitions are doing for us. They're measuring and controlling a distance. So if we want to get to know distance a little bit better, we should think, what is the minimum structure that's necessary for us to come up with some coherent idea of distance that is going to comport with our ordinary ideas of distance that we're bringing in from absolute value in the case where we want to measure distance between real numbers? What is kind of the essence of what it means to measure a distance? That's what's being captured in the definition of a metric space. A metric space is nothing more than a set. It doesn't even have to be a set of real numbers. It could be a set of anything at all. 
And there are some really powerful examples of metric spaces where the metric is on top of a set, not even of numbers, but maybe a set of, oh, I don't know, images that are being used by facial recognition software to determine who is whom, right? That's an example of wanting to measure a distance between two images to see, is my face closer to Brad Pitt's or is it closer to, I don't know, Benedict Cumberbatch? Um, that's an idea, example of a metric space where the the elements of that space are not necessarily just numbers. So metric spaces can be built on top of any set at all. The only requirement is that we have some coherent way of measuring the distance between two elements of my set. That distance is measured by a function, and we call that function the metric on this space. And we say that it's a function whose domain is x cross x. So in other words, it's taking two elements of x as the input to my function, and it's producing from those two elements a non-negative real number. And we're going to call that non-negative real number the metric distance between those two points. So what is it that's necessary in order that this function uh, that takes in two points from my set actually gives me a coherent idea of distance? We can't just put any old thing in here. We're, we're going to want distance to still have some of the properties that we want to take for granted when we talk about distance in ordinary contexts. So there's four things that we need for this distance function, this metric, to satisfy in order for it to actually be a metric. The first one is, just like we learn in ordinary high school geometry, we should never have a distance if we want it to sort of relate to the distance that we're used to from geometry. We don't want our distances to ever be negative numbers. So all of the values that my metric takes are going to be non-negative. That's already sort of built into the notation that I have up here. And so more specifically, it says that for any x and y, the distance between x and y is greater than or equal to 0, no matter what. But then things get more interesting, because that greater than or equal to allows for two possibilities. It allows for the possibility of a positive distance, and it allows for the possibility of a zero distance. And the next property tells us that that zero distance only happens if I'm measuring the distance between a point and its very self. This is a property called non-degeneracy. A metric is non-degenerate because the distance between x and y is equal to zero only in the case where x and y are the same element of my set. And what's great about this is it gives us a way to use the metric, use a distance function, to detect sameness of two elements. If you hand me two elements in some random metric space and I measure the distance between them and I get zero, then I know for sure that you must have handed me two of the very same element. This non-degeneracy property is super, super helpful. It means that as soon as we get our distance down to zero, we know that we are exactly at the same point. Third property is symmetry. We don't want the distance between x and y to depend on the order in which we pronounce the words x and y. The distance between x and y is the same as the distance between y and x. This is something that we generally take for granted when we even just use the English words, distance between something and something. It doesn't matter which order we pronounce that second half of the sentence. And then comes the property that is probably the most valuable property for us. It's also the one that's not the most obvious when we think about what distance it should satisfy. But it's a property that tells me that, in a sense, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, straight line doesn't have any meaning in the general metric space on a set context. So let's say a little bit more specifically what I mean. If I have three points x, y, and z, then it should never be possible for me to get from x to z via a shorter distance by taking a detour to a third point that I call y along the way. Right? So if I go from x to y and thence to z, that total distance cannot be any shorter, cannot be any less than the direct distance from x to z. So a distance function should have this shortest when it's direct property that's otherwise called the triangle inequality. The distance from x to z has to be less than or equal to the distance from x to y added to the distance from y to z. So this is the triangle inequality for metrics. Now we've already seen an example of a triangle inequality for absolute values that we're going to return to in the next video when we verify that the ordinary absolute value of the difference between two real numbers actually does satisfy all four of these properties. And so we really have been talking about a metric all this time when we've been using absolute values of differences of real numbers all semester. But of course, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in that philosophy. And so in the videos that follow that, we're going to see some examples of other types of metrics that are of interest to us. Uh, and then we'll use one of those or one or two of those other kinds of metrics to start talking about how to measure the distance between functions and then to discuss the idea of the convergence of a sequence of functions. And that's where the rubber really starts to meet the road.